Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Species ID from Sepsis Causing Pathogens in 3 to 5 Hours, Days Faster Than Blood Culture. This webinar is hosted by T2 Biosystems, makers of T2 Direct Diagnostics, a suite of FDA-cleared CE mark tests that rapidly identify the most common and clinically relevant pathogenic organisms directly from whole blood without the weight of blood culture. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. When you join today's webinar, you selected to join either by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ryan Shields and Dr. Sandy Estrada, who will share their clinical experience with T2 Canada and T2 Bacteria. Dr. Ryan Shields is Associate Professor in the Department of Medicine and Clinical and Translational Research at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. As a clinical pharmacist, he is actively engaged in both antimicrobial stewardship and the management of patients infected by multi-drug resistant bacteria and fungi. Sandy Estrada, PharmD, is the Vice President, Medical Affairs, T2 Biosystems. She is also current president, Florida Society of Health System Pharmacists, FSHP. Dr. Estrada was previously the infectious diseases clinical pharmacist for Lee Health in Fort Myers, Florida for 13 years where she served as the co-director of antimicrobial stewardship and director of the ID pharmacy residency program. And now I will turn today's presentation over to Dr. Estrada. Thank you, Elki, so much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to discuss species ID from sepsis causing pathogens in three to five hours many times days faster than blood culture. For those of you who may not be familiar, I would like to start today's discussion by sharing a little bit of information about T2 Direct Diagnostics and the current panels that we have available, both FDA approved and CE marked. You can see the instrument that is utilized, the T2DX, that can detect organisms as low as one CFU per ml. It is easy to operate with minimal hands-on time in your laboratory and consists of two different panels, the T2 bacteria panel, consisting of the five most common escape pathogens, and T2 Canada panel, consisting of candida species known to cause approximately 95% or higher of the species causing candida infections today. This is currently the only FDA cleared direct from blood test for bloodstream infections. And the T2 bacteria and Canada panels are considered to be CLIA moderately complex assays approved to be used in the routine clinical laboratory. The T2DX instrument fully automates the detection process in a sample to, to answer fashion with all of the technology happening underneath the hood of the instrument. This allows a 4 ml tube of patient blood to be drawn, loaded directly onto the T2DX instrument, after which the cells are lysed and amplified and the target DNA is detected through a clustering of nanoparticles and magnetic resonance imaging. This allows for species identification directly from whole blood in three to five hours. When we consider the ability to detect pathogens directly from whole blood in three to five hours, this represents a paradigm shift from our normal process of identifying seps sepsis causing pathogens. In current standard practice, when a patient presents and is suspected of sepsis, whole blood is, is collected, sent to the laboratory where blood cultures are incubated, and anywhere between one to five days later, the blood culture may become positive. The current sensitivity on one set or the first set of blood cultures is between 50 to 65%. Once a positive blood culture is detected, then anywhere between one to 48 hours later, we have a species ID. 
this time frame is dependent on whether other molecular technologies are being used in the laboratory, such as PCR, MALDI, film array, or ferrogene technologies, all of these requiring a positive blood culture before the organism can be detected. If we contrast that to the T2 technology, once the whole blood is detected, it is placed directly on the T2DX instrument, and then three to five hours later, that species-specific result is detected and reported to clinicians, allowing for the potential to impact therapy on our patients. If we take a closer look at the T2 bacteria pathogens, these pathogens cover about 50 to 70% 70, 70 of all bacterial infections and about 90% of escape pathogens. And they were chosen because they are particularly concerning due to their ability to escape and survive standard antibiotic therapy. Just to give a few examples, Enterococcus faceum is currently responsible for about 6% of bacteremia attributable mortality and is known to be about 60% resistant to vancomycin. Staph aureus is the most common cause of bacteremia with a five times higher risk of in-hospital death. Then our gram-negative pathogens, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, and E. coli, are all associated with high mortality rates and growing resistance to various common antimicrobials utilized in patient care, including cephalosporins and, in some cases, carbapenems. In addition to those listed on the screen, on our panel available in Europe, we also have Acinetobacter, which is known to be associated with hospital outbreaks and multidrug resistant infections, and is another important pathogen to detect in sepsis patients. When we take a look then at our current diagnostic and treatment paradigm, we have some challenges with getting appropriate empiric therapy for our patients. Antibiotic administration rates range from 50 to 70% of all patients with a blood culture taken, although many of these may not actually be infected due to the risk empiric broad spectrum therapy is started. Even with this broad spectrum empiric therapy, a recent meta-analysis of 70 studies found that empiric ther antibiotic therapy was inappropriate in 46.5% of cases, or almost half of the patients. However, once organism specific species ID has been shown, then the proportion of effective therapy is greater than 90%, demonstrating effectiveness of antibiogram directed therapy based on species ID. So taking a look at the slide here, we can see that for really the first two days, the patient remains on empiric therapy while we're waiting for blood culture to incubate waiting for a gram stain, and then we get that species ID usually somewhere between two and three days, after which we have antimicrobial susceptibility testing, or we may be waiting for additional cultures. If the cultures were negative or inconclusive, then the patient remains on empiric therapy versus if a species is identified, then between day, and th day three and four, species-directed therapy can be started, which means honing in on that pathogen and many times de-escalating from broad spectrum antibiotics or discontinuing antibiotics that may not be necessary once we know what the pathogen is. This concept is important because we know that time to appropriate therapy impacts survival. So several studies, including the study from Kumar et al., which showed that survival decreases by 7.6 for every hour delay in time to appropriate therapy on patients with septic shock. However, in patients who are bacteremic without septic shock, the relative odds of death is still increased by 4% um, in this patient population. So really taking the sepsis or suspected sepsis patient population as a whole, we've recognized in the medical community that getting patients on appropriate therapy quickly is important. And many of our sepsis initiatives, including the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, have focused on these concepts and asked clinicians to start empiric broad spectrum antibiotic many times within one hour of patient presentation to the emergency department. Studies have shown that reducing time to effective therapy has resulted in significant reductions in length of stay up to eight days, so significant impacts on both patient care as well as on hospital costs. So while we recognize that this appropriate and rapid delivery of targeted antibiotics is critical for surviving sepsis, we also recognize that the overutilization of antibiotics is a concern. And antimicrobial stewardship programs throughout the world are really focusing on how can we do a better job 
of knowing what we're treating sooner, getting the patient on the appropriate therapy, but also getting the patient off of antibiotics that may not, in fact, be needed. Because of this, Rapid diagnostic tests have become an integral tool for antimicrobial stewardship programs. And many programs have found that coupling their program with ra rapid diagnostic tests empower clinicians to make appropriate and timely changes to their patient care. This leads to improved patient outcomes through optimization of antimicrobial use, specifically decreasing time to effective and optimal antimicrobial therapy. Cost savings with antimicrobial use, of course, follow this, and ultimately a reduction of associated hospital costs, as we've mentioned, things such as length of stay. So if we take that concept of basically blending an antimicrobial stewardship program, which is focused on getting the right antibiotics for the right patients as soon as possible with rapid diagnostic technology, and now we add a technology such as T2MR, which gives us culture independent species ID, we can now, in fact, have the opportunity to know the species of the pathogen infecting our patient in as little as three to five hours, allowing the opportunity for some antimicrobial decisions to be made, not only on the first day, but potentially as soon as between the first and second dose of antibiotic therapy. I'd like to transition now to sharing some clinical data. As was stated in the introduction prior to my work uh, with T2 Biosystems, I worked at Lee Health in Fort Myers, Florida. This is the fourth largest public health care system in the United States. It's a non-for-profit community health system with a, a four adult acute care facilities and one freestanding pediatric hospital. We had been utilizing the T2 Candida assay for several years at Lee Health with great success in both reducing our antifungal utilization and reducing length of stay on our patients. So we wanted to evaluate the potential utility of the T2 bacteria panel in optimizing antibiotic therapy in sepsis patients and guiding overall antimicrobial stewardship. The primary outcome of the study at Lee Health was time to organism identification using the T2 bacteria panel compared to that with standard blood cultures. This was a residency project that was conducted by my resident, Emily Wise, last year. And in addition to looking at our time to organism ID, we wanted to look at secondary outcomes of percent concordance of T2 bacteria with blood culture and finally, the total number of potential antimicrobial stewardship interventions that could be conducted, including both escalation and de-escalation opportunities. This was a single center prospective observational study. At the time of the study, T2 bacteria was not yet approved, and so we did conduct the study um, observationally. Patients were enrolled from the emergency department with informed consent from November of 2017 through March of 2018. Patients were enrolled in the study uh, if they had suspected sepsis and a national early warning score or new score of greater than or equal to seven or one red score. They could also be included if they had a new score of greater than, e greater than or equal to five or one red score with neutropenic fever. Considered patients were consulted and informed consent was obtained for enrollment by the protocol trained pharmacist. Blood samples for T2 bacteria and blood culture were obtained concurrently from each patient enrolled, and the T2 bacteria sample was hand delivered to the on site laboratory. The results were interpreted by the protocol trained pharmacist and results supporting antibiotic de-escalation were recorded as potential interventions, but no adjustments were actually implemented in this study. 25 patients were enrolled in the study with two being excluded for 23 available in the final analysis. You can see the demographics of the patient population listed here with a mean age of 65, approximately half of the patients were male, about 40% had recent antibiotic exposure, um, either in the outpatient setting or from an outlying facility, and the mean news score was nine with a range of seven to 12. We looked at the source of infection and the majority of cases were classified as undefined sepsis at the time of enrollment, although their source may have been further delineated later on in their course of stay with a variety of other sepsis sources included as we would expect. <clears throat> 
Looking at our microbiologic results, there were a total of 11 patients um, with positive results in either T2 or blood culture um, for a total of 18 organisms, and we can see these better listed on the current slide. If you look at the circles, where the circles intersect, these are the results that were consistent or concordant between T2 bacteria and blood culture. So four isolates of Staph aureus, one isolate of E. coli were detected by both T2 bacteria and by blood culture. There were four isolates of Staph and Strep species that are not on the T2 bacteria panel that were identified by blood culture. And there were one E. coli, one Acinetobacter, one Klebsiella, and two Pseudomonas that were identified by T2 bacteria that were not identified by blood culture. So looking at our secondary outcome, results that created opportunities for intervention. In this patient population, a total of 36 opportunities for de-escalation were identified. The de-escalation opportunities were evaluated by asking two questions. Could we de-escalate coverage for Staph aureus if Staph aureus was not present? And could we de-escalate coverage for Pseudomonas aeruginosa if Pseudomonas was not present? De-escalation opportunities were assessed based on several factors and clinical characteristics of the patients, including patient history, source of sepsis, antibiotic history, and local antibiogram information. To give you a sense of how this data analysis occurred, I will conclude with two case studies from this research project. The first is an 84-year-old male with diabetes, prostate cancer, and end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis. He had been admitted to the emergency department after experiencing chills during dialysis and revealed that he had not been feeling well for a little over a week. He was found to have a fever of 101.7 and a lactic acid of 3.2. His urinalysis was negative. Like most of our sepsis patients in the emergency department, he was started empirically on vancomycin and piperacil and tazobactam. The blood culture for this patient was positive for Staph aureus on day three, and piperacil and tazobactam was discontinued at that point in time. Looking at the paired T2 bacteria result, it was positive for Staph aureus, confirming the blood culture, negative for the rest of the organisms on our panel. So analyzing the opportunity with T2 bacteria is that potentially the piperacil and tazobactam could have been discontinued two days earlier if the T2 bacteria result, which was finished at four hours, would have been presented to the clinician. The second case is a 53-year-old immunocompromised, morbidly obese female with recent history of surgery to drain an intra-abdominal abscess. She presented to the emergency room about eight days post-op with fever, chills, and abdominal pain. She was started on empiric antibiotics and admitted to the emergency room. Her empiric antibiotics were linazolid as trianam and metronidazole, with linazolid being chosen over vancomycin due to her morbid obesity, and as trianam and metronidazole being chosen over piperacil and tazobactam due to a penicillin allergy. She had both blood and urine cultures collected, which were negative. She continued on her empiric IV antibiotic therapy for five days, where she clinically improved and then was transitioned to two days of oral antibiotics prior to discharge. Her T2 bacteria result revealed positives for E. coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa with negatives for Staph, Enterococcus faecium, and Klebsiella. In analyzing this case with a negative Staph aureus, we could have considered discontinuing the nasalid on this patient um, because with a negative Staph aureus, there was not MRSA present in this patient's um, particular T2 result. And so we could have focused on targeting her gram-negative coverage to cover E. coli and Pseudomonas, and also would have likely kept the metronidazole as anaerobes are not detected by the T2 bacteria panel and also are not commonly um, found on blood culture even when present in intra-abdominal infection. I hope that these two cases have been illustrative as to some of the considerations that can be made using a T2 bacteria result in conjunction with clinical judgment in a specific patient case scenario. I would like to conclude with sharing that in addition to our T2 bacteria panel, which I have just spoken about, our T2 candida panel, which Dr. Shields is going to share a little bit more about, we also have a T2 candida auris panel, which is available for research use only um, in those scenarios where candida auris is of concern. And we also recently just announced our T2 resistance panel, 
which is in development, will be available for RUO use in the United States later in 2019, as well as CE marked, and then FDA approval pending uh, potentially next year. You can see that the T2 resistance panel covers the majority of the common resistance mechanisms that we're concerned about in both gram-positive and gram-negative organisms, including MEC-A, VAN-A, VAN-B, some common ESBL and CRE-producing um, organisms and the genes related to those. So at this time, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I would like to pass it over to Dr. Shields, who will share his experience with T2 Candida. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Estrada, for that great overview. Um, similarly, at the University of Pittsburgh, we've been using T2 Canada for a couple of years now, um, and in fact, almost two years to the date that we've been um, running live with T2 Canada, and we're currently evaluating T2 bacteria as well. And really, our interest in, in the technology really stemmed from an important clinical dilemma that we encountered pretty frequently, and that is diagnosing invasive candidiasis is a major challenge. And there's three reasons why this is true. The first of which is, as Dr. Estrada pointed out today, blood cultures take time. This is particularly true for Canada, where the median time to positivity is two to three days and oftentimes may be even longer. So initiating early antifungal therapy is contingent upon us having early results and we know that this is important for improving patient outcomes. This has been shown in a number of landmark studies that are over a decade old now, but we know the earlier you start antifungal treatment in patients with candidemia, the lower the mortality rates are for our patients. So obstacle number one is it takes time to get these blood culture results back. Obstacle number two, as Dr. Estrada also alluded to, is blood cultures are generally insensitive. But when we talk about insensitive blood cultures for, can for diagnosing invasive candidiasis, it's important that we understand the entire spectrum of the disease. And in my mind, and, and has been published in the literature, invasive candidiasis really constitutes three different entities altogether that have some overlap in between. On the far left-hand side of the Venn diagram here, you can see candidemia. These are our patients that might have central venous catheter line-related infections with candida, where they really don't have any deep-seated sources of infection, and the source is ultimately their catheter or an intravascular source. On the far right-hand side of the, of the diagram, you see patients that might have deep-seated candidiasis. These are generally our surgical patients after intra-abdominal procedures that might have abdominal abscesses or peritonitis, where blood cultures are negative, but we know candida is in the gut and pathogenic. And on the intersection, then, we can see patients that might have deep-seated candidiasis with candidemia. Now, in terms of talking about blood culture sensitivity, we know that the incidence of these three entities in large part falls into about one third each. So one third of patients have candidemia, one third with interabdominal or deep-seated candidiasis, and a third in this intersection area. The sensitivity of blood cultures then varies across these three disease entities, where the diagnosis of, of invasive candidiasis for patients that really truly have bloodstream disease, blood cultures work fairly well, where the sensitivity ranges anywhere from 60 to 80%. On the other hand, though, patients that do not have positive blood cultures, the sensitivity is much lower for diagnosing invasive candidiasis that's at deep-seated sites. And so if you combine these two percentages, then oftentimes we know that we're missing up to 50% of invasive candidiasis because our only diagnostic tool is blood cultures, which are going to miss some of the disease. The third obstacle in, in diagnosing invasive candidiasis is identifying the right at-risk patients. This is a major challenge because if you look across our three entities, the patient populations vary significantly. Candidemia is a disease that generally has a very low incidence of among very large at-risk populations. You may think of this as anybody in your hospital that has a central venous catheter is at risk for candidemia, but ultimately very few patients will have the disease by diagnosed by blood culture. On the other hand, deep-seated candidiasis is a very high incidence disease but really among much more narrow patient populations, and these are generally abdominal surgery patients. And in fact, you can look across um, the different patient examples, which are shown here on the table, where your risk of invasive candidiasis varies quite substantially, where your lowest risk patients are really any hospitalized patients that might have a blood culture or a central venous catheter. We expect that they will have candidemia less than 1% of the time. If you jump to the bottom of the graph, then we know we see patients in our hospitals that have a very high risk of invasive candidiasis. Such patients might be those that have a liver transplant with a bio leak or maybe severe acute or necrotizing pancreatitis, 
where they're very likely to have deep-seated candidiasis and the incidence exceeds 20%. Now, knowing the incidence from the literature across these various patient populations is very important for how we use antifungal therapy. Again, going back to our lowest risk patients, we know that the risk of true candidemia is so low that instituting early antifungal therapy would be quite difficult. In fact, we don't want to give every patient in our hospital antifungal therapy with the chance that we're going to maybe detect one in 100. On the other hand, for our highest risk populations, we know that antifungal prophylaxis has been shown in the literature to have benefit. And in general, once the incidence for candidiasis exceeds 15%, there is benefit for antifungal prophylaxis. So that's why you see the second red line here. For patients with the highest incidence of disease, these are patients that are generally going to be on prophylaxis. Now, in between is really where we struggle and there's a lot of questions. When to use empiric antifungal therapy or maybe preemptive antifungal therapy across various patient populations. And this is exactly the niche in which I think non-culture-based diagnostics like T2 Canada can ultimately help us. We have other tools available to us as clinicians. Of course, there's been a number of prediction scores and Canada scores that have been published in the literature over decades of research in this field. The Canada score is, has been available for a number of years. Most recently, the mycosis study group has developed a clinical prediction rule, and that has been tested in clinical studies, as well as the Empiricus criteria for using Empiric mycofungin. And so we evaluated all of these criteria at our center, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, to see how well they were working for finding patients with invasive candidiasis. And we started with a very simple exercise. We did a retrospective review of patients at UPMC that had candidemia, or blood culture positive can candidiasis, in the ICU at our hospital. And we evaluated patients over a couple years. What we did is we evaluated patients across three different ICUs, our medical ICU, our transplant ICU, and our surgical ICU to give us a good representation of different populations at risk for candidiasis. And when we applied the criteria either through the clinical prediction rule or the Empiricus criteria, which are supposed to help us guide early antifungal therapy, we saw that only about a quarter of our patients would ultimately have met the criteria for these rules to initiate early antifungal therapy. More practically meaning, we're missing three quarters of the patients with candidemia by using clinical prediction rules. Moreover, we found that a number of patients were never even started on antifungal therapy because the delayed diagnosis and waiting for blood cultures to turn positive, anywhere from 20 to 13% of our patients in our ICU never received antifungal therapy before ultimately succumbing to their infection and dying. In fact, our median time to initiation of antifungal therapy was greater than two days, speaking to the challenge of waiting for blood cultures to diagnose invasive candidiasis. Now, at our center over this early period, this led to 30-day mortality rates exceeding 50% among our ICU patients with candidemia. So clearly we knew that this was an opportunity to look for additional help. And we were thinking of non-culture-based diagnostics as helping us identify these patients that we could initiate early antifungal therapy in. And when you're thinking of the ideal non-culture-based diagnostic test, there's a number of things that we'd love to have as clinicians. One of which is we want a test that's highly sensitive and highly specific for our target, in this case for Canada. We also want something that we can turn around rapidly, where we can make early interventions through our stewardship committees uh, and, and guide antifungal therapy appropriately. Ideally, the test should not be dependent upon organism replication or an organism growing in a blood culture that ultimately would be flagged as positive. It would be even better if we had a test that could identify Canada species where we could guide antifungal therapy based on species and known susceptibility patterns. And then ideally, the positive and negative predictive values we could use to both start and stop antifungal therapy. And in our mind then, T2 Canada really filled all of these boxes. It's been shown in, in, in patient studies now that the test has a very high sensitivity and specificity. It identifies the five major Canada species, and you have a turnaround time of three to five hours directly from whole blood. So the test is great. It certainly gives us new opportunities to guide antifungal therapy. But I think we also have to ask ourselves as clinicians, how can we use this test effectively? And to me, the, one of the most important predictors of how to use this test appropriately is to know what the test is giving you. This is not a definitive diagnostic test that ultimately uh, gives you the, the diagnosis of invasive candidiasis on its own. 
you need other measures in terms of patient characteristics and ideally blood cultures, which are the gold standard to help confirm the diagnosis. So really then, I think of non-culture diagnostic tests like T2 Canada as Bayesian biomarkers of disease. Much like biomarkers we often use in many of our ICUs, procalcitonin, for instance, or beta-D-glucan, these biomarkers are used to help assign probabilities of disease. So a higher or lower probability of disease may change our way that we use antifungal therapy. And in fact, I found the Fagan nomogram that was published in the 1970s to be very useful for this exercise where we know that some patients, as we've shown from our chart, have a pretest probability of invasive candidiasis that may range from a very low pretest probability of less than 1% to patient populations that have a higher probability of disease greater than 20%. And if you know the sensitivity and specificity of our test, for this exercise, we'll assume that T2 Canada has a 90% sensitivity and specificity, you can calculate likelihood ratios and using the Fagan nomogram then, you can assign what your post-test probability of disease is. So let me walk you through an exercise on how this nomogram may be useful to you as a clinician. If you say have a patient that has a pre-test probability of invasive candidiasis as let's say 10%, this might be somebody that's been in your ICU for more than a week on broad spectrum antibiotics and has a central venous catheter in place. Those patients may have upwards to a 10% risk of disease even without a diagnostic test. But once you apply the Fagan nomogram, and let's say you have a positive T2 biomarker that comes back, you know that you can look at the likelihood ratio, which is right around 9 to 10 for that test, and your post-test probability of disease now shoots all the way up to 50%. So you may initially be a little bit, um, a, a little bit reserved in starting antifungal therapy when there's only a 10% chance of disease. But if you have a positive test like T2, now your probability of disease jumps up to 50%, and I think we would all agree that's a patient that warrants antifungal therapy. A negative test can also be very useful for you. Starting with that same patient that has a 10% pretest likelihood, a negative T2 almost exclusively rules out the disease because your negative predictive value is so high. In fact, your negative predictive value here is about 99%, meaning that that same patient only has a 1% chance of disease, which may make you feel more confident in withholding antifungal therapy or potentially even stopping empiric antifungal therapy in this context. The other thing we know about biomarkers of disease is these should always be performed in parallel with blood cultures. Blood cultures, albeit they take time and they're insensitive, they are the gold standard mark um, for how our field practices infectious diseases and how we ultimately diagnose candidemia. And then finally, we have to understand how risk varies across certain patient populations. So I wanna take you back to the table that we've started with here where we know we have patients at higher or low probabilities of disease, but in the middle is where we struggle with knowing when to start antifungal therapy. Well, if you use the Fagan nomogram and apply the characteristics of T2 Canada, for instance, you can extend this table to calculate the positive predictive value and negative predictive value of T2 Canada. And in fact, when you would use the positive predictive value of the test, now you've identified many po patient populations that could ultimately benefit from the test, pushing the, the likelihood of disease above this threshold of 15%, where we know initiating antifungal therapy has shown benefit in the literature. If you're a visual person, I'll walk you through the same exercise. What you're looking at on the black line here is just the probability of invasive candidiasis with no test, meaning your pretest and post-test probability of disease is exactly the same because you have no biomarkers of disease. But you can run all the calculations with positive and negative predictive values and know that the patient with a 10% risk, a positive test would shoot the probability of disease up to 50%, where a negative test gives you a very low probability of disease, and this is true across a continuum of at-risk patient populations. So when we evaluated T2 Canada at our hospital, we wanted to start with a patient population where we had a good sense of what the pretest likelihood of disease really was. And for that, I think that's a really important consideration because the more heterogeneous po patient populations you use the test in, it's really hard to draw definitive conclusions. So we wanted to do a pilot study at our center for just patients that had specific risk factors. And so we started with patients that had candidemia that had medical host factors, such as septic shock, organ failure, and prolonged ICU stays. And so we developed then a T2 Canada pilot in our medical ICU for patients with septic shock. One of the drivers of this decision is because we know, as Dr. Estrada has pointed out, patients in septic shock have very high mortality rates and time matters. 
This is particularly true for canademia, which has been shown by Dr. Collis and colleagues at WashU that the longer you wait to treat canademia in the setting of septic shock, your mortality uh, doubles within the first day. So here's how we developed our, our pilot program in our medical ICU. We started with patients with septic shock where they had, were defined by having suspected infection and vasopressor use for at least three hours. Based on what we know from the literature that these patients defined by these criteria would give us a pretest likelihood of disease somewhere between three to 8%. We then instructed our teams to order T2 Canada at the same time as they would order blood cultures so we could compare the two results. And then results were reported directly to our stewardship team. The bottom point is very important because our stewardship team ultimately guides how antifungals are used in our hospital. So we wanted to make sure that the results of T2 Canada were reported to the team such that they could, they could facilitate early antifungal therapy, but also provide education on what the test meant in the context of individual patients back to our ICU team. So this was not only a way to guide antifungal therapy, but to extend education about the T2 Canada test itself. So moving forward then, we knew that some patients would have a positive T2 Canada result. And in this population, a positive T2 result would increase our positive predictive value somewhere between 20 to 40%, which again is above our 15% threshold for where we know initiating early antifungal therapies probably has benefit for patients. Of course, the test gives you species, so we felt comfortable then guiding our antifungal therapy based on the species to either an echinocandin or fluconazole and initiating early antifungal therapy as soon as this T2 result was available. Subsequent to that, we know blood cultures would also be pending at this time. And so then we could make further decision trees based on the results of a blood culture. So in the best case scenario, you would have a positive T2 result and a positive blood culture, and those patients would get standard treatment for candidemia of at least 14 days. You may have other patients that have a positive T2 Canada result, but negative blood cultures, and these patients at least warrant some antifungal therapy, but we'll get to this cohort in just a bit. On the right-hand side of our schematic, we knew that the negative predictive value of T2 Canada was going to be particularly powerful in this population because it would almost exclusively rule out the setting of canademia for these patients. So for patients with a negative result then, if their septic shock resolved, we felt confident in withholding antifungal therapy for those patients. However, if their shock persisted for greater than 48 hours, we instructed our teams to go ahead and reorder the T2 assay so we could evaluate for candidiasis moving forward. So let me walk you through a patient case that was one of the, the recent patients we just treated in our medical ICU where we applied this algorithm. This is a 74-year-old woman that came to us from an outside hospital with ARDS and septic shock secondary to pneumonia. She initially went to the outside hospital with fever and cough and was diagnosed with community-acquired pneumonia and admitted to their ICU and started on empiric broad-spectrum antibiotics, including azithromycin, piperacillin, tazobactam, and vancomycin. She was subsequently intubated and sedated due to respiratory failure, and at the outside hospital, blood cultures group strep, pneumo strep pneumonia, and her antibiotics were changed to ampicillin, sulbactam, and azithromycin. Subsequently, on day three, upon transfer to our hospital and day 10 of hospitalization overall, she became febrile again, tachycardic, and hypotensive, requiring norepinephrine. And this is what triggered our process in the medical ICU, as we had a patient now with septic shock requiring vasopressor support. So per protocol, blood cultures in T2 Canada were sent on this patient uh, on January 30th at about 11 o'clock in the morning. Our stewardship team received a call just a little over four hours later that the T2 Canada assay was, has come back and it was positive for Canada albicans and Canada tropicalis. Per our protocol then, the patient received their first dose of antifungal therapy promptly, only four hours after the initial blood culture was taken. And subsequently then, several days later, Three days later, in fact, blood cultures also turned positive for Canada albicans. So this is a case in which we were able to initiate early antifungal therapy within four hours of drawing blood cultures for somebody that had blood culture positive canademia that later we didn't find out about until three days after blood cultures had been taken. So this shows you the power of using T2 Canada to initiate early antifungal therapy for patients in septic shock. Now, the negative predictive value of the test was also very useful to us in our experience over the last two years of, of using this in our medical ICU. Because again, we feel comfortable with holding antifungal therapies for patients that have a negative T2 and their septic shock resolves. So we thought it would be a good idea to look at our overall antifungal use now having used the test for almost two years. 
And so when we evaluated nearly 100 patients that had received T2 candidate testing in our medical ICU, we saw that 25% of patients received empiric antifungals. Oftentimes, these antifungals were started at the same time that T2 Canada was ordered. All of these antifungals were discontinued with negative T2 blood culture negative results at a median of about two days. So patients that were generally started antifungals only received one to two days of antifungals before teams felt comfortable stopping. Importantly, we avoided antifungal therapy altogether in all other patients. So the other 75% of patients with T2 negative results never received antifungals. And we looked then at our overall usage of caspofungin and fluconazole in our medical ICU, where before using T2 Canada, we had a median duration of median days of therapy of 26 days every single month. After implementing T2 Canada in our medical ICU, we decreased antifungals by almost half, down to 15 days a month, which we showed as a significant trend in our antifungal utilization. It's also been shown in the literature that empiric antifungals are really hard to stop once we start them. This was a study I found very interesting that was done in Italy, where they collected T2 Canada among patients very similar to our MICU protocol, where patients were identified with severe sepsis and septic shock who had other risk factors for canademia and were started on empiric antifungals. These patients were identified, T2 Canada was collected, but not not delivered to clinicians. In fact, T2 Canada was evaluated for its effectiveness in this population. And so clinicians did not receive these results. Overall, they enrolled 46 patients in their study and only one of them had blood culture positive candidiasis. But what I found particularly important is that even though clinicians did not have these results, they still continued empiric antifungals for, for a median of seven days and upwards to 13 days in some patients. This shows you once you start these empiric antifungals in really sick patients, it's hard to know when to stop them. And this is a good re reminder that oftentimes patients are left on prolonged antifungals and maybe they have varying risk factors over time. Now the T2 Canada results in this case were mostly negative, but there was four positives. And so this is an important distinction then that we have four T2 Canada positives, but only one blood culture positive. And in fact, this is a scenario we've seen at our center as well. And so we asked ourselves, what is the significance then of having a T2 positive result and a blood culture negative result? Well, you can look at the randomized controlled trial that is done for T2 Canada give, give us some insights. This is a multi-center study of patients with canademia. So it's for enrollment, they had to have positive blood cultures with Canada. And then what the study did is they repeated blood cultures known as companion blood cultures and collected T2 Canada at the same time. Overall, this study enrolled 152 patients, and you can see here that 69 of the 152 at the time companion blood cultures were collected, T2 was positive. And in fact, the T2 was positive and companion blood culture was positive in 32 of these patients. Overall, 32 of 36 patients with positive blood cultures had T2 positive, justifying from a clinical sense that the sensitivity is about 90% for this test. But what I found particularly important here is that T2 also identified 37 patients that had negative blood cultures upon repeat testing. So in fact, T2 Canada identified patients that might have persistent bloodstream disease. And this was significantly associated with antifungal therapy, which I think is an important caveat for why you might see this discordance of T2 results and blood culture results is that what we know about blood cultures is they're very sensitive to initiation of antifungal therapy. In fact, after starting antifungal therapy, it's very hard to get positive blood cultures where T2 may give us some additional insights. And this was true in the multi-center study shown here. So what's the importance then of a positive T2 as perhaps a predictor of outcomes? Well, there's been a couple of nice studies done by a Spanish group that I want to draw your attention to. The first of which is a study among patients that had T2 positive results within five days of a positive blood culture. And the investigators of this study showed that, in fact, T2 was an independent risk factor for complicated canademia, which they defined as having deep-seated metastases of canadiasis or having, more t having, having death due to canada-related complications. In fact, the adjusted odds ratio was 36.5 for having a T2 positive within five days of this positive blood culture. And this was an important predictor for complicated bacteremia. The other piece of this puzzle that I thought was particularly impelling is that blood culture results and another non-culture based diagnostic like serum beta deglucan did not correlate with outcomes as well as T2 did. The second study from the same group showed that in fact, patients that had baseline T2 Canada results 
after starting antifungal therapy were shown to be an independent risk factor for death and proven disease. And they used this to stratify patients then with candidiasis that might have a poor outcome defined as death or complications or a good outcome, and these are patients that survived. And what they showed is that T2 was positive in 36% of patients with a poor outcome, but T2 was not positive in patients with a good outcome. And so perhaps then we may be able to use T2 to decide which patients need more aggressive therapy. And ultimately, maybe this test over time will help us decide durations of therapy, particularly if the test is negative and these patients go on to have a good outcome. Again, blood cultures and serum beta deglucan did not correlate with outcomes in this study. So if we summarize then what we found in the MICU with what we've learned in the literature, I think for us, the biggest success of our pilot program was implementing T2 within a very targeted patient population and using the test results to guide antifungal therapy. For us, this has really been a multidisciplinary approach where we've coordinated very closely with our microbiology lab, our infectious diseases teams, our ICU teams, our nursing leadership in the unit, as well as our stewardship team to really implement a process in which antifungals could be started early in patients with disease and discontinued early for patients that had a, poor, a low likelihood of disease. Secondly, what we've shown is that among all patients with candidemia that we've identified in our pilot study, all of the patients we've identified received antifungal therapies in less than eight hours after identifying a T2 positive result. We're also able to discontinue empiric antifungals using the negative predictive value of the test, and this has resulted in decreased antifungal use and cost savings for us as a hospital. But finally, I think the other important thing of piloting the T2 candidate in our MICU allowed us to do is build confidence in the test, how to use the test, interpret the test, and ultimately has allowed us then to expand to other patient populations. And so we went back to our Venn diagram and asked ourselves, what are the other patients at our hospital that are particularly high risk for candidiasis? And it became evident that the next cohort of patients we were interested in was our surgical patients that might have abdominal surgery, GI perforations, or necrotizing pancreatitis. Now, I won't walk you through all this entire algorithm, but I think one of the important things to remember for patients with intra-abdominal candidiasis is that some patients are going to have a very high likelihood of disease, greater than 20%. So they're at high risk for invasive candidiasis. These are not the patients where T2 Canada is going to help because ultimately these patients have a high enough risk where they should be on antifungal prophylaxis regardless of the result of the test. So what we were looking for in our surgical populations was patients that have a more moderate risk of invasive candidiasis, somewhere between this 10 to 15% threshold where we know the test could help guide our antifungal utilization. We defined a number of criteria among patients that, were in, that we were interested in using T2 for, and much like we did in the MICU, we used the results of T2 to guide antifungal therapy. The other important consideration in this population is source control, and so we guided in negative results in the context of source control and when we would either reevaluate the test or start antifungal therapy, and each of these is shown here for you. So what about these surgical patients? Might T2 Canada ultimately help us find this missing 50% of patients with invasive candidiasis? So I think this is an illustrative case of a 73-year-old man with ulcerative colitis who was admitted to our surgical ICU with a small bowel obstruction. He had extensive, extensive lysis of adhesions. He underwent a right hemicolectomy, a small bowel resection, and an ileostomy. He was clinically stable until on hospital day eight when he developed new fevers and hypotension. He was at that point empirically started on broad spectrum antibiotics, including cefepime, metronidazole, and vancomycin. On hospital day 10, just two days later, he had worsening sepsis and now required vasopressor support. A CT scan showed free air and fluid collections in his abdominal cavity, and he underwent an exploratory laparotomy for drainage of ascites and resection of his abdominal wall. During the X-lap, they sent peritoneal fluid and tissue cultures um, to try and diagnose the disease. On hospital day 11, he had no improvement and at this point required increasing vasopressor support. The primary surgical team started caspofungin empirically and then per our protocol we put in place, we sent blood cultures in T2 Canada at about 10.30 in the morning. Again, just about four hours later, T2 Canada was reported back to our stewardship team as positive for Canada albicans and Canada tropicalis, but ultimately blood cultures for this patient were negative times five days. So what do you do in this context then? Where a T2 helps you, it increases your positive predictive value, but now you have a patient with negative blood cultures. Is T2 a good test for detecting deep-seated candidiasis in the absence of positive blood cultures? 
And does this patient need definitive treatment based on this biomarker of disease? These were questions we were asking ourselves until about a day later when then we got more information. Both peritoneal fluid and tissue cultures that were taken during the XLAP grew Canada albicans. So now we had a case where blood cultures were negative, but we had deep-seated sites of disease that were positive for Canada. And in fact, T2 Canada identified this several days before the cultures grew. So now certainly we felt comfortable in treating this patient for an intra-abdominal candidiasis infection. So this just reminds you that we're talking about patients on this side of the Venn diagram where blood cultures are less useful, perhaps then T2 Canada can help us identify some of this miss missing 50%. Finally, I'll just close by pointing out one of Dr. Estrada's, I think, important studies that shows us T2 Canada is a test that has broad use across a range of different patient populations. You may not have the same surgical populations or medical ICU populations that we have at the University of Pittsburgh, but I think it's also important to understand there's not one right way to implement this test. Ultimately, you have to understand the patient populations at your hospital that are at the highest risk for invasive candidiasis and how the test can be useful to not only guide antifungal treatment, but then perhaps guide uh, other antifungal stewardship metrics like antifungal savings and decreasing your duration of empiric therapy. All of these things were shown to be true at Lee Health System by Dr. Estrada's group. Again, in a community health setting, another, commu another hospital setting, different from ours at an academic medical center, but shows you T2 Canada has utility across a range of different practice sites. So I'll conclude by saying this. I think T2 Canada has certainly proven for us to be a useful adjunct to blood cultures for the diagnosis of invasive candidiasis. And we've used the test to guide antifungal treatment. And it's really for us been an important tool in our antifungal stewardship initiatives. It may also have utility in predicting outcomes of patients with complicated candidemia. And this might help us with longer versus shorter durations of therapy for antifungals. It may also help us identify patients in this missing 50%. This is one of the areas where we need a lot more research to understand the importance of having a T2 positive blood culture negative test for patients at high risk for deep seated candidiasis. And this is a field that I think we'll get more information on as the test is used more broadly. And then finally, I'll reiterate that centers really must understand their local patient populations and their epidemiology to use this test most effectively and ultimately position it for those patients that can have the greatest benefit. So with that, I, I thank you all for your time, and I look forward to any questions you might have. I'll turn it back over to you. Great. <clears throat> thank you so much for the great presentation, Dr. Shields and Dr. Estrada. We've already begun receiving some interesting questions, and now we can begin submitting these to you. As a reminder, you can still send in your questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. So our first question asks, how does this compare to BioFire or Veragene, which offers results in only a few hours? Dr. Estrada, I'll, I'll re refer to you for the bacterial panel. Sure, absolutely. Um, so the question was regarding how would BioFire or Veragene compare to uh, the T2 bacteria panel? And so the important delineation to make is that both the BioFire and Veragene panels are post-culture diagnostics. So they are able to provide rapid species identification uh, within several hours after a positive blood culture. However, as we discussed earlier in the presentation, there are two limitations there. The first is the sensitivity of blood culture. So if the blood culture remains negative, then there is no ability to use uh, the post-culture test. And the second, um, the second limitation is the time that it takes the blood culture to become positive. So in contrast to that, the T2 bacteria panel is performed directly on whole blood, potentially when the patient presents to the emergency department or when they first so show signs and symptoms of sepsis, allowing that result to be given within three to five hours or between the first and second dose of antibiotics. Um, so similar concept, but different technologies and performed at different times in the patient presentation. Wonderful, thank you so much. Our next question asks, what patient's population should I use for each test and how do you use this with other diagnostic tests? Yeah, I can comment on that in the context of T2 Canada. And I think it's really gonna depend on what patients you see at your hospital that are at the highest risk for invasive candidiasis. And what's unique about invasive candidiasis is we have decades of literature that help us assign pretest likelihood of disease. 
So we're really looking for those patients that might have a pretest likelihood of disease somewhere between this 5 to 15%, where it's too low to automatically give them antifungal therapy, but a non-culture-based diagnostic like T2 could give you the confidence then to either start antifungal therapy or continue to withhold it. And those patients can range anywhere from medical patients that are in your ICU on broad-spectrum antibiotics with central venous catheters or have a kind of classic canademia risk factors, all the way then to patients in, like we've shown in our surgical ICU that have abdominal procedures and maybe sepsis that are at risk for invasive candidiasis, but just to, aren't at high enough risk to warrant prophylaxis. These are really kind of the niche populations that you want to identify at your center. It's the, really the sweet spot for where diagnostics give you the most bang for your buck. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you. Our next question asks, I get it, and the technology is great, but I read recently this doesn't change the standards of care. What would be your response? Again, I'll comment on, on that from our experience at the University of Pittsburgh. It really has changed our standard of care. What we saw was very similar to the Italian experience in our medical ICU when empiric antifungals were started. They were often continued for at least a week. Um, because we were waiting for blood cultures or other diagnostic tests to come back that ultimately gave us little confidence in, in stopping antifungals. We've been able to use T2 then to change our standard of care of how we're using antifungals in the ICU, and that's shown in our graph from decreasing antifungal use by more than almost 50% uh, in just the most recent couple of years. So it certainly does help change the, the standard of care for antifungal utilization. I think it also changes the standard of care of how quickly we can implement antifungal and act antibacterial therapy for patients that might not be on imp appropriate empiric therapy by getting results back sooner where we can get patients on the best therapy even earlier. And we know from all the, the, the ICU literature that the earlier we start appropriate anti antimicrobial therapy, the better our outcomes are going to be for patients. And I'll just add on to that, in, a, in addition to the huge benefit of being able to start a therapy sooner for patients that have a bacterial infection that's potentially not covered, there's also the potential stewardship benefit. And I think we could really change the standard of care from a stewardship standpoint using T2 bacteria by being able to uh, much as much as Dr. Shields was able to show reducing the antifungal utilization, I think the opportunity to reduce inappropriate or unnecessary vancomycin and piperacillin tazobactam or other broad spectrum therapy in our emergency departments and ICUs could really make a big difference for our patients. Great, thank you so much. Looks like we have time for about one more question here. Um, we do have several questions in the queue, but in the interest of time, I think we're only going to be able to get to one final question here. How do you act on use a negative result as the bacterial panels only cover five organisms? Do you de-escalate based on a negative result, or do you use other diagnostics in conjunction with negative results, and if so, which ones, CRP, PCT? Sure, I can, I can speak to that. So I think the question brings up an important point. And so T2 bacteria, like any test, is one tool that we utilize in the overall care of our patients. And so when considering how to act on a negative result, the most common approach that I've seen, similar to the one that we took in our study at Lee Health, is to evaluate for example, if the test is negative for Staph aureus, then do you still need vancomycin empiric therapy? Or if the test is negative for Pseudomonas, do you still need anti-Pseudomonal coverage? And that's a decision that has to be considered in conjunction with several other things, such as the source of infection. So in the example I presented where the infection was intra-abdominal, the likelihood of Staph aureus as the pathogen was low, but the patient did have risk factors due to prior hospitalization and surgery. So knowing that the T2 bacteria was negative may give the confidence to stop an antibiotic that uh, we're pretty sure we don't need, but we're using in just a just-in-case scenario. And so I think the important thing to do is, is look at the overall risk factors of the patient, look at what's positive and what's negative, and then make the decisions based on each of those scenarios. And just like we've seen with T2 Candida, um, you know, as we collect these data uh, to make sure that we share them and get more literature on the exact benefits will help us all um, to see even more areas where we could potentially utilize these results. Great, thank you so much. And we're gonna go ahead and wrap up today. I'd like to thank 
uh, our presenters and everyone for joining us today. If you do have any other questions, please do contact the email shown on your screen. It's k-g-o-n-y-e at t2biosystems.com. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. We would pre appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You'll also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of T2 Biosystems and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.